Today, we are going to be continuing our sermon series on SHARE, Developing a Culture of Radical Generosity. Pastor Lisa kicked off this sermon series for us with a message on what it means to be people who both give and receive. And then the next week, Pastor Adam talked about how we need to be rooted in Christ if we want to be giving, that any of our giving flows out of that place of connection, our relationship with God. Then last week, we had Pastor Peter who challenged us to get practical and, and consider how, how giving connects to the practice of hospitality, how we show hospitality not only to our friends and family, but perhaps even to strangers. And today, we're going to look at the topic of sharing our financial resources at money. And money can sometimes be a tricky thing to talk about at, in the church, and this is actually my first time ever really preaching a sermon about money. So if I say anything that touches a nerve or, um, yeah, if you want to talk some more about anything that I say today, feel free to send me an email. I'd be happy to have follow-up conversations with all of you because um, I'm excited to learn more about what God has to teach all of us, myself included, about money and what it means to share our financial resources. So today, to help us kind of unpack and get into the subject of sharing our money, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. But before we do that, let's pray. Dear God, as we open up your word this morning, help us to receive from you so that we in turn can share what you give to us with the people around us. Today is Pentecost, and we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit on the church. We pray that the, by the power of that Holy Spirit, you would open our hearts and speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're going to read from, chapter, from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. And you can turn to that um, if you have your Bible or on your app, or it'll also be up on the screens here. There is no need for me to write to you about the service to the Lord's people. For I know your eagerness to help, and I've been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting in you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident." So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and to finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift and not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of this service which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. This is the word of the Lord. Let me start with giving a little bit of context for you. 2 Corinthians is part of a letter that the early church planter Paul sent to the Christians in Corinth. In this part of the letter, Paul is writing to them about a special offering that's being taken up among the churches to be taken to the poor in Jerusalem. Paul has written to them about this offering before. In his letter, 1 Corinthians, he writes about the offering saying this, 
On the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. So, now in 2 Corinthians 9, Paul is following up on this offering because this offering is an important one that's being taken up to send to the believers in Jerusalem. And it's important for a number of reasons. First, the most obvious of them is that there are Jewish believers in Jerusalem who are undergoing financial hardship and have an economic need. Second, beyond that, Paul hopes that this offering will build unity between Jewish and Gentile Christians. As the good news of Jesus spread around the world, non-Jewish people, Gentiles, started joining the church. Questions came up in the early church about whether these new followers of Jesus needed to follow Jewish dietary laws, be circumcised, or keep other aspects of Old Testament law. And at times, this became quite controversial and heated in the early church, and there were some divisions at times in churches between the Jewish believers and between the non-Jewish Gentile believers. So Paul is, is very passionate about seeing these two groups united in the church, and he hopes that this offering of Gentile Christians taking up an offering and, and helping meet the physical needs of the Jewish believers will help strengthen and connect and bring unity across the different churches. So finally, through this offering, Paul is also inviting his predominantly Gentile audience to learn a new way to relate to their material possessions. One commentary that I read as I was preparing for this message said that in the Greco-Roman society at the time, the only reason to give to others would be to get something back or to show one's status and power that you're someone who has enough that you can give and you might get honor and glory for that. There wasn't this idea of, of showing concern for the poor or that that was something that the gods wanted them to do. So this Jewish Christians would have been familiar about God's concern for the poor and the importance of giving regularly to others. Is that something that's quite highlighted in the Old Testament? However, for the, the new believers in Corinth who were coming out of the Greco-Roman culture, this would have been a, a new thing to collect money to give to the poor out of compassion for others. It would have been quite countercultural. And so offerings continue to be a regular part of worship in our churches today. Like the Corinthian churches, each week we're invited to set aside a sum of money in keeping with our income so that it can be then be given to others. And then, and while charitable giving is a lot more common today than it was in the Greco-Roman world, it can still be a challenge at times to part with hard-earned cash and to give. In Western culture, money is often viewed as something that we earn and that we deserve. And it, then it's ours to do with as we would like because we've made sacrifices for it. We've worked hard and we've invested wisely. So we get to enjoy what we get. When we think about how hard we've worked and all the things that we could do with it, it can be hard to think about giving it away. We also tend to assign a certain status to having lots of money. If you drive a nice car, have a nice house, or, or wear the right kind of clothes, people will treat you differently than if you drive a different sort of car or don't have the nicest clothes. There's a certain societal pressure at times to keep up financially with our neighbors and the people around us, the people we associate with. Advertisers have built an entire industry around getting us to part with our money. We're bombarded with messages that tell us we need bigger, we need better, we need shinier, we need fancier. In order to, to fit in, in order to belong, in order to have joy and happiness in life, we need to buy into a certain lifestyle. As we compare our, our lives with others and the, li and the lives of those around us, the, the lines between what we need and what we want start to become blurry. And then as we buy more and the expenses start to add up, people may find that they routinely start spending more than they're bringing in. And then when there's not enough to pay the bills, how can one even start to think about giving money away? I'll never forget a sermon I heard about money one time when I was a graduate student. The pastor named all the different reasons we come up with at different stages of life not to give. 
said when you're in high school, you're, you're saving up to, to get to university. And so you think, I'll give later. Right now, I really have to save my money. And then you're, you're perhaps in school and college or university, and you're paying tuition, and that's quite expensive. And maybe you're even taking out loans, and you think, well, I can't give now, God. I'll give later when, when I get a job. But then you, you get your first job, and you start making money, but, but then there's other expenses then too. You're paying rent, or maybe you're buying a house, or perhaps you get married, and then you got a big wedding to pay for, or you start having kids, and before you know it, you start thinking, well, there's just not enough to give. I'll give later. I'll give later. I'll give later. And the pastor really challenged us. He said, there's never really an ideal time to start giving. It's always possible to find a reason not to give. So in that sermon, the pastor challenged us all, no matter what our life circumstances were, to start giving. It didn't matter how much. The important thing was the act of giving itself. And not just to give the leftovers at the end of the month, but to give from the first, from the beginning, and then watch and see how God would provide, and there would be enough. Paul's instructions around giving offer a new way to understand the important role that giving and generosity play in the life of someone who follows Jesus. Just engaging in the very physical and tangible practice of intentionally setting aside a portion of one's financial resources to give away to bless others has a transformational impact on one's relationship to money and to other material possessions. As I reflect on this text, what stands out to me is that Paul's invitation to participate in this offering is an invitation to enter into a new kind of lifestyle, a lifestyle of generosity. It's an invitation to experience a depth of joy and peace that ironically cannot be found by, by buying lots of stuff and having worldly possessions or having an impressive bank account. Paul's experienced this transformation himself firsthand. We know from reading the book of Acts and his letters that, that Paul was once a relatively well-to-do leader in the Jewish synagogue. He also enjoyed the privilege of being a Roman citizen, which means he was born into a good family. But Paul gave all that up to follow Jesus. He went from a prestigious position and probably having a lot of possessions to traveling all over the place as a church planter, not quite sure where his next meal would come from, working in his trade sometimes to make money, sometimes getting money from the churches. He was put into jail multiple times. He was beaten. He, was, he went through all sorts of suffering for the sake of Jesus. And yet, in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, he writes to them this remarkable thing, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Through Paul's lifestyle of, of radical generosity, he's discovered a joy that's, that's not based on his circumstances or on his material possessions, but rather a joy that, that flows out of his relationship with Christ his Lord and Savior. And Paul wants the, the believers in, in Corinth, and he wants us today to experience that same sort of joy. And so in this passage, he encourages people not to give reluctantly or out of compulsion, but to give cheerfully. He writes, each one of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In the verses that follow, Paul points to three things that we'll start to experience as God transforms our mindset around money. Three things that, that bring peace and allow us to become cheerful givers who give cheerfully and generously. They are, first of all, contentment in God's provision. Secondly, confidence in God's promises. And thirdly, connection to God's people. So let's unpack those three things a little bit this morning. First of all, contentment in God's provision. Take a look at verses 8 to 10 of our text this morning. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. 
as it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Paul points to God as the source of blessing. God has given so much. And we've already reflected on that and and prayed about that this morning as Connor led us in our our prayer of confession this morning. that, That God has given of his very self in his sacrifice on the cross and the gift through Jesus Christ. That the God has given the gift of the Holy Spirit to us to be at work within us, to empower us to serve him. When we experience the gifts of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, those are all gifts from God. God not only provides for us spiritually, but also materially. He may not give us everything that we want, or even everything that we may think we need, but he will provide what is needed to do the work that he calls us to do. Rather than seeing money as as well-deserved reward for work done well, that we get to spend on whatever we want, this passage invites us to see money as a good gift from God, given to us to take care of and use wisely in order to bless others to see the jobs that we have as gifts from God, to see the different sources and opportunities we have as gifts that God has given us. A word that's often used in the church that you may have heard before when talking about money is this word stewardship. And this word comes from the idea of a steward was someone who would take care of a piece of land or some possessions for someone. If someone had a big property, maybe like a property manager would be another kind of word in today that we would talk about. And so the idea is that all that we have belongs to God and we are stewards of it. We are the, the property managers of the, the things that God has brought into our lives and blessed it with. And so... When we think about it like that, we have a lot of responsibility to use those things wisely, to take care of them. And it changes the way we approach and make decisions about our possessions and about our finances. As individuals and as a church, we look at what God has given us and we want to do our best to use that in a way that brings honor and glory to him. Contentment in in God's provision prepares us to also experience confidence in in God's promises. Looking back at how God has provided in the past, we can trust that he will continue to provide in the future. This brings freedom from the anxiety and fear that, that there won't be enough, that it's all up to us to get it on our own. We can share what we have now, trusting that God will continue to provide in the future. As Paul writes in this text, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Towards the end of the passage, Paul explains how how cheerful giving also leads us to deeper connection with God's people. In verses 11 through 14, Paul describes how this offering will build a relationship between the givers and recipients of the gift that is being given. Because of this gift, the the believers in Jerusalem will give thanks to God and and offer up prayers for the the givers of the gifts. It creates a a beautiful circle of generosity where where God is blessing the Corinthians and they are offering this offering of, of blessing to the people and the people in turn are offering up this blessing back to God. It's beautiful. This lifestyle of generosity can offer a a deeper joy than anything money could buy. A friend of mine would testify to the truth of that. He gave me permission to share his story with all of you today. This friend was raised to get a good paying job with benefits and a pension so that he could take care of himself and his family. The more money he could make, the better. He spent the first quarter of his life in pursuit of financial success, pouring everything into that. He chose a career path that would have a minimum amount of of money needed to get to that career path and that would make a good wage. And he started having a good success. 
he was able to build up a, a good career and was doing well for him financially. By, by age 25, he even had his own house and was doing quite well. Then he became a Christian and he got involved in a, a church. And when he got involved in the church and when he was first saved, he, he started giving in every way, getting involved, doing different things, except for financially. That he still held back at first. And over a period of time, God did a work in his heart. He was volunteering, or he was participating in a young adults group at the time, and, and the leaders asked him to um, do some offering messages, to take up the offering and, and prepare like a short two to five minute thing before the offering each week. And so week after week, he prepared these short two to five minute little reflections on giving on pretty much every chapter in the Bible um, about giving or about money. And he says he now has a whole stack of them. And, and slowly God was doing a work in him. God was breaking down his love for money. When I got to know Dylan Harper, some of you know him too, he was working on staff here at Hope Fellowship Church as our youth director. He'd, he'd left his career and was in the process of, of studying to become a pastor. Now, in 2020, his family packed up their life and they moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he's now full-time studying for ministry. And I connected with him this past week just to talk to him about this story, because I remembered him telling him bits of me bits and pieces of it when we were working together in the office. And he shared that, that while money still has a pull, it's no longer the driving force in his life. When he looks back on, on his life before, when he was pursuing money and really working for it, there was no joy at the end of the day in that lifestyle. When money's your God, he told me, you can never have enough money. There's not enough zeros you can add to bring contentment and happiness. He shared that their family has learned to live a simpler life. They see that, that God continues to provide for them and all their needs are met. And he talked about the, the joy that comes from giving and knowing that, that when he's giving to the church, the money that he gives is able to join with other money. And through God, God, through all of that, God is able to do things that he could never do just on his own. He said something like this, and I, I'm paraphrasing it a little bit, but he said there's something so satisfying about getting someone a gift and watching them open it and seeing the joy in their eyes when they realize that it's just something they really wanted that joy of giving and blessing others. And he said, sometimes when I'm giving money to the church and, and putting it in the collection plate or making a donation, I, I picture wrapping up a gift and giving it to someone. And I imagine the, the difference that gift could make. Somewhere down the road, someone's gonna get to open that gift and it could change their life. My biggest prayer is that someone will open it up and discover the new life that they can have in Christ. And that's the beautiful work that we get to do as a church. I love the banner that the visual arts team has put on the stage for this series on SHARE, developing a culture of generosity. And as they heard about this series, this banner came to mind. Choose joy. And, and I've been thinking about that ever since the first week. And I think that to enter into a life of generosity is to choose a life of joy. As we look ahead into a new ministry year, I wonder if God may be calling us into a season of choosing joy. Joy that we will discover as a community as we embrace God's invitation into a lifestyle of cheerful giving and lean into what it means to be a church that exists not only for our own sake, but for the sake of others. At Hope Fellowship Church, we often say that we are blessed to be blessing. What does it look like for us to put that into practice in tangible ways? God is on the move in our community, in Curtis, here in Ontario. And we get to join him on that mission. We get to be his, his hands and feet as individuals and as a church, to partner with him. He's inviting us to give, not out of a place of, of obligation or guilt, but from a place of gratitude and joy, 
from a desire to, to praise him with our whole lives and to see others respond as well with praise to him. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for your generosity towards us. Thank you for blessing us with new life in Christ. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to empower the church for ministry. Thank you for the gift of, of new life each day to live for you. And God, it's been a hard few years for us as a church. There's been a lot of ups and downs with COVID and with staffing changes. There's been a lot of hard things, God. God, we pray that as we enter into a, a new chapter, a new beginning, that joy would come with the morning. Joy not, not just coming because we've called a new pastor, or because some circumstances are changing, but joy that's rooted in you. Joy that's rooted in our relationship with you. Joy that's rooted in, in living out our mission as a church. Joy that's rooted in, in seeing how your gospel changes the lives of people as they, they get to know you and experience the transformation of, of having a relationship with you and having the spirit working in their hearts and lives. God, be at work in us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to be cheerful givers when giving is hard. When generosity doesn't come naturally to us, transform our hearts. Work within us so we can more deeply experience the joy of giving the joy of sharing. Show us each and every day how you are providing. Help us to trust that you will continue to provide and help us to see how we are all connected to one another and the responsibility we have to care for each other. May we learn to give and receive from friends and even strangers with grace and with gratitude. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.